Assalamu alaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Institute of Marine Engineering, Science and Technology Technical Meeting. My name is uh, Nikki Lignani and I'm the Honorary Secretary of the IMRS uh, UAE branch. Uh, I hope all of you have read the invitation. In any case, the, between the 9th and the 13th of April, lucky for some, the MEPC 72nd session convened in London and uh, some of you might be aware there was, there was some decisions taken, as they always do during the MEPC sessions. Noteworthy and relevant to our discussions is uh, the MEPC uh, or the IMO, in fact, came to some conclusions regarding greenhouse gas emissions, as well as capped the sulfur content of fuels to 0.5% by 2020. Of course, there are other discussions also, but uh, we can't get into that, including like ballast water, but uh, maybe we'll be look at it at uh, another session. So what we, we're here now today to look at chip air emissions. Air, what are the challenges? What are the policies uh, specifically? And how has the industry responded to, to these policies? This is the agenda for, for this evening. I will soon introduce uh, <coughs> Aldia de Bella. He is the RENA uh, Marine Director for the Middle East and Africa. That would be followed by the IMO data collection system, uh, relevant to what I just spoke about earlier. We'll have a Q&A session. Uh, Stephanos, are you OK with uh, Q&A being asked during the discussion, or would you prefer it uh, after? No problem. No problem. Yeah. Thanks for being flexy. So Stephanos uh, has been kind enough to uh, take your questions as he progresses, which is always a good thing because sometimes you don't remember and today you don't have tables, so there's no way to write down. So please, like I said earlier, raise your hand and uh, thanks for being uh, accommodating enough to take questions midway. And we will then have a, uh, like I said earlier, what, is, what has been the market response to this uh, 2020 sulfur cap? We have presentation, uh, closure and final remarks, board of thanks and uh, we will have, uh, Rena has been gracious enough to invite us all for dinner. So once we finish, please join us uh, outside. And uh, during the dinner, we'll have our uh, world famous raffle draw. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, let me introduce uh, Stefanos uh, Hagi Nikolaou. Hadzi Nikolaou. He's the senior manager, marine research and innovation at Rina Hellas. Stephanos is responsible for the marine research and innovation activities of RENA in Greece and the Balkans area. He's also responsible for the training activities of RENA class society in the same region. He holds a diploma from the School of Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering of the National Technical University of Athens, Greece, NTUA. He's been working for more than 10 years as a research engineer in the laboratory for maritime transport of NTUA, being involved in European and international funded research projects in non-funded research. He has also been involved in education in the undergraduate program of this university and in professional training in areas such as ship environmental performance, energy efficiency, maritime safety and human factors. In his PhD studies, he developed methodologies for the environmental impact analysis of ships. Results of his research work have been published in academic books and journals and reported in peer-reviewed international conferences. He's involved in the RENA team working in the Ship Energy Efficiency Solutions, InfoShip Ego Software, and in the team that works for the development of competence management systems for onboard and ashore personnel. Carlos Itate to Dubai, Stephanos. The floor is all yours. Oh. <laughs> Before, before we do that, <laughs> <laughs> let's have the boss of uh, Rina share a few words with us. So, sorry about that. No, no, no. <laughs> the floor is in fact all yours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Nikhil. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks a lot uh, for being here uh, this evening. It, uh, it is a re really a pleasure to have so many people from the maritime industry gathered here this evening. And, uh, well, actually, we have to get rid of the usual table we have uh, during this kind of occasion because uh, since that the subject is of great interest and a lot of you have uh, decided to join in this evening. Thanks a lot for being here. I would like, uh, I would like just to say a few words uh, to introduce uh, the topic uh, of this evening. 
And uh, well, I would like to start uh, just with a couple of questions. Who knows uh, how much are the global CO2 emissions? Uh, it's a real, a real question. <laughs> I mean, who would, uh, who would like to dare to give an answer? The global CO2 emission of the entire world. How much is it? In tons. The whole, the whole. The man-made. 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 Man-made.
performance and the environmental uh, improvement of shipping. So today we're going to discuss about two very, very important areas of concern for the ship. We're going to discuss about the greenhouse gas emissions, which is the subtopic one, but uh, we will mostly focus on CO2 emissions, the carbon dioxide emissions, because these are the emissions that we meet most in our industry. And these are the emissions that now we have to uh, monitor in a more systematic way with the data collection system of IMO. The second part of the presentation is about the, what we call air pollutants. This is another category of emissions for, from shipping that have different impact from the first. And uh, what is most important in this uh, second uh, category of emissions is SOX emissions, or sulfur oxide emissions. SOX, we call it. But it is a, actually a collection of sulfur oxide emissions. These are causing other kinds of problems. And for this, again, we have a new regulation coming in in 2020, which is uh, well known as the sulfur cap. It's the global sulfur cap. It's a, a, a limit on the content of sulfur in marine fuels, which starts globally from uh, uh, 2020. Before doing that, I would like to make a short introduction just to see the magnitude of a problem and what are the challenges that ship, uh, shipping uh, faces. So, as I said, we, we divide the air emissions in three important categories subject to their impact. The first are called greenhouse gases. The main is carbon dioxide. Another very important is methane. <coughs> methane is very, very important greenhouse gas. Do you know a very common, a very well-known uh, fuel that we are using? That it's mostly methane. We have a fuel that is methane. It has a huge impact <coughs> on the environment. They say that uh, the impact of one ton of uh, methane compared to one ton of CO2 in the greenhouse gas is 25 or more times. Oh, meaning more from problem. boiling off? From boiling off, of, of, if, of, I have, uh, if I have one ton of methane in the environment and one ton of CO2 in the environment, the impact is different. Methane is 25 <laughs> times more oh. important as an impact. The other, the other part is, um, is the main air pollutants. I will uh, use the words NOx, SOx, PM. This goes for NOx is the nitrogen oxide. SOx is sulfur oxide. PM is the particular metal. FOC is for volatile organic compounds. And we have also the carbon monoxide. As I said, we divide them according to their impact. Greenhouse gases have global impact. And the main impact is what we know, the climate change. is the increase in the temperature, is the average temperature of the planet. Air pollutants have local impacts. And the main impact they have is, of course, they have an ecosystems. But the main impact they have, the main impact they have is on human health. We pay money to avoid the impacts of uh, air pollution. Our insurance goes up. Our health expenses go up because of air pollution. Now, Andrea already uh, told us some numbers. Well, we are in, compared to the man-made emissions of greenhouse gases, we are now, latest fingers, 2015, at 2.6. Compare, compare this 2.6 with the production of greenhouse gases of humankind. This is a very low figure. We can all agree. It is very low compared to the number of ships. It's about 50 or more uh, in the national city, 50,000 or more. 
and the amount of transport work that international shipping uh, performs. Now, if we make some more comparisons in the transport sector, sector we can see that in, in the transport we emit more or less the same emissions of greenhouse gases as the aviation, more or less the same. Uh, because the aviation has, uses very, very uh, specific uh, fuels. The main contributor, as you can see, is road transport in the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, enough with this, let's go further. What is the problem? One main problem that we have, even if we emit 2.6%, is that all, or nearly all, the uh, projections about the future of international shipping say that shipping will grow as a market, which is good for us, because we're working in the market. Trading with shipping, cargo, transporting with shipping will go up, will grow. And there are some projections uh, which say that we can double or even triple our greenhouse gas emissions in the years to come, if we don't do anything. This is one challenge that we have to face. We are very low in the production of greenhouse gases, but we are very, it is expected that we will grow as a market, so the greenhouse gases will be more. A second challenge is the, what we call the quality of marine fuels. And we all know that the quality of fuels used in shipping is very low compared to other transport modes. We will go to discuss about this later on in the software, in the second uh, subject. Now, another challenge that shipping has, and uh, it's also a source of criticism against our industry, is that we have a great potential, we, got, we have great opportunities of reducing these greenhouse gases. This is a, a table coming from the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, that has set two kinds of uh, measures to reduce the greenhouse gas in the design phase and in operation. And if you can see here the figures, what is the potential of the savings per ton mile of CO2 if we implement some of these categories of uh, solutions? For example, a very, very usual uh, measure that we're using is fleet management, logistics, and other incentives. Now we are close to 5 or 6 percent, but we can go up to 50 percent of improvement if we optimize this area, fleet management, logistics, and uh, There are huge opportunities. Speed, we know that we use it as a first measure of uh, uh, optimizing our greenhouse gas, we use speed. Okay, we are using it for other reasons. But we have a, a positive effect for in greenhouse gas as well. We are using energy efficiency measures. This is what I'm saying. But this great potential to have more benefits in these two areas, in design and operation. And this is another challenge that uh, shipping has to face. Now, the challenge of energy efficiency, if we combine all the discussion and all the, um, let's say, uh, points, being sent here and there, we can see three areas of optimization that are the three areas of sustainability. Sustainable is a product or a process that has economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, and social sustainability. It has to be improved in these three areas, in the economy, in the environment, and to provide benefits to the society. Otherwise, a solution, a product, or a process is not sustainable. And if we see what is the challenge that we have to face, 
we have to reduce our fuel consumption. We know that. This will produce benefits for us, for city, because we will use less fuel, but produces also benefit uh, to the market. This is economic sustainability. We have to reduce uh, our fuel and our fuel costs. We have to reduce emissions, we know that. Well, that's why we are here, we're going to discuss this. Why? Because we want to reduce our environmental impact. This is environmental sustainability, of course. And the third part is to reduce the health impacts of these emissions, which, is, which offers some benefits to the society. Okay, here is only a selection. Uh, but if shipping, the national shipping was to contribute to sustainable future, has to do, to do it in these three dimensions of sustainability. Okay. Let's go, to the, I said enough about the uh, first part of the vaccine. But energy efficiency, of course, is cost effective. Of course, it's becoming a necessity, and it's a demand not only from regulation, it's a demand from the society. This is what we have to know. Of course, it's an industry demand. Of course, it is a demand by regulation. Now, in this very complicated finger, uh, figure, I have to uh, point out one or two things. I already told you that we are doing, we are implementing energy efficiency measures. We're doing that. Is this enough? This is what uh, this figure tries to uh, uh, point out. Now, this is the carbon intensity. It is the carbon intensity. It is the CO2 per ton transport work. And this is the whole CO2 emissions that we need. If you see this sector, this uh, segment, the general cargo segment, it has a very good result in energy efficiency measures. It's close to 5%. They are doing good work, chips. And it, there is no segment that is not doing good work in energy efficiency. We are all producing something in energy efficiency. We have good results. This is the the yellow or orange. But most of the segments are keep increasing the overall emissions. Okay. Do you get it? So we may implement some measures and we make energy efficiency because our CO2 per transport work is better. But the overall emission of the segment goes faster. So even if we are currently introducing energy efficiency measures, our CO2 emissions are expected to grow. This is why we have to do more things. <coughs> this is the rationale behind, behind this uh, figure. The overall CO2 intensity of cargo carrying ships has decreased by 3.5%, they say, in only three years, 2015, 14, 15. But the overall, uh, CO2 has been increased by 7%. This means that it is not enough. And this is official uh, information coming from the International Council of uh, Clean Transportation. It's a uh, recent work. Let's see. Now, if you want to sum up what you have said in the introduction, we know that we do not emit too much of greenhouse gases. It's less than 2%, 2.6. We know at the same time that we are going to uh, grow by volume in the future. And of course, if the shipping is going to grow in the future, it's going to grow its emissions. Scenarios say double or triple. We saw that the shipping non greenhouse gas emissions, the air pollutants, are very important to the users to have effects. We saw that we are using relatively low quality fuels compared to other modes of transport. 
And we also saw that shipping has great emission potential, reduction potential. And of course, as a final remark, we know that our uh, all of our solutions, all of, of our measures at the moment are not enough. This is the introduction that's gone out to the first sub subtopic, CO2 emissions. I'm going right away to the data collection system, the DCS of IMO. So IMO has developed a data collection system for fuel oil consumption of ships in order to address the greenhouse gases, the CO2 emissions. This is a regulation only for CO2. It is, it is in the national regulation in MARPOL Annex 6, regulation 22A, uh, and it's enforced. It's in force, it means at the moment we are a few months before the 1st January 2019 where the reporting period starts. The first reporting period will be in the year 2019. Now, what we have to do is to make a new part in our SEM, the SIP Energy Efficiency Management Plan. This is called CM Part 2. And we're going to see what is to be included in there. We are going to report, each ship has to report its CO2 emissions in one year, and after this, it's going to submit the data collected to a verifier or to a, 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 row, a class society. This, this data should be verified if they have been reported in the way that the regulation requires. And after this, a statement of compliance should be issued uh, 2020, late of May. After this, what I know it will do is to collect all the data coming from the city companies, and it's going to um, develop, as they say, a fuel oil consumption database with anonymous data, not data naming ships, uh, operators, <coughs> ship owners, etc. And I have to, uh, to say this because the other data collection system of Europe does the opposite. It collects emissions and it names the ship, it names the company. This is very different. <coughs> this is the MRV system that we in Europe have to comply with. So there is a process. <coughs> the process is very well connected with regulation. Of course, we have to develop. Now we are in this stage. We are developing, we are improving, let's say, our SEM. You have to uh, write down in the SM, what are the sources of your CO2 emissions? Main engines, auxiliary, boilers, gas turbines, inert gas generators. Incinerators are out. We don't have to report anything from, uh, from them. The first thing that we have to do is to identify which are the sources of CO2 on board your ship. And then you have to select a method. There are three methods of doing this, of collecting information. Either you use what we know well, the BDNs, the bank uh, fuel delivery mode, and we'll, we'll also have to perform some periodic uh, uh, subtakes in, in our fuel tanks. Method B is about monitoring of fuel tanks uh, on board our ships. And method C is for those ships that are equipped with uh, flow meters. Uh, we can select information coming from the sensors, and you can submit uh, uh, the information to the, to the end. But what is important is, if you select one method and you write it down in your SEM, this is the method that you will be tested for. When the class society, what the verifier has to test you. You write down that I'm using method A, and you are going to test it for this method. This is very important. Now. The process, I think that we have already said, the ship is the entity, 
Each ship has to submit this information, not its company, every company, each ship. The flag state administration will collect the data from the ROs, from the classification societies, and then the IMO is engaged to produce this uh, uh, information about the ships. Uh, now, be very careful. Many of you might be subject of uh, monitoring and reporting two times information about the CO2. If your ship is, goes, uh, has trades in uh, Europe, you already, you should already, <laughs> have the MRV, the monitoring, reporting, and verification according to a European regulation. This is, I'm not saying uh, much about this uh, regulation. It is very close to what DCS asks for, but there are also differences. So, you might be uh, subject to these two uh, reporting and monitoring uh, requirements. And if you can see the timeline, the timeline is very close. The MRV has... <laughs> The MRB has started. We are in the reporting period in the MRB. It is the first important period that we are in this year. The IMO comes with a one year delay. Okay? This is the main point here. Now, if we are going to see some uh, similarities or differences, the main difference is that the EU MRB wants to report also the transport work, the cargo per voyage, which is very, very sensitive information. In our IMO DCS, there is no such obligation, which is good. <coughs> uh, the other uh, big difference is that we don't name, I say that already. There is a public database in the EU MRB. It is, uh, if you know, the FETIS database that we Mostly the post-state control inspections are reported there. So now that is improved to, collect, to include also information about the UMRB. This is publicly, publicly available. Anyone else can name one ship and can see from next year how much CO2 it emitted in the previous year in EU. This year, no. In IMO, no. Data will be without names of ships, without names of ship owners. And uh, the other difference is that um, in this year we report fuel consumption, in uh, MRB we report emissions. You have to calculate emissions. This is slightly different. Now, what is the shipping industry, what the shipping industry has to expect from these two regulations? There are three possibilities in the future. The first possibility is that we proceed with no alignment of the two regulations. If there is no alignment of these two regulations, then every ship that goes in Europe but has other trades as well has to report for MRV, for EU, one set of data, and one set of data for DCS. This would be the case if we are in the non-alignment, the first. If there is full alignment, which is the scope of M MRV, I have to say, the regulation of the Europeans say that we want to comply, we want to align with uh, IMO. But for this to happen, we have to uh, see the reaction of uh, EU to the new strategy of IMO. We haven't seen it yet. If we have full alignment, then this is the easiest way because maybe we collect the same data and we report two times. But it's going to be the same. It's going to send two emails, one to Europe and one to Ivo. This will be easy. And there's also the partial alignment uh, case, which is a kind of a hybrid. The similar elements are harmonized, but there will be also differences. What we want is to have the full alignment, the second one. 
in order to avoid administration and uh, documentation issues. Uh, but we are expecting the reaction of uh, Europeans probably by the end of the year. <laughs> don't know yet. Now, as you already said, uh, there is a new strategy of IMO about uh, uh, greenhouse gases. This has been decided last month, April, in ABC 72. And this is uh, the main discussion here in the next slides. There have, have been made very important decisions in this NPC. IMO has set a strategy up to 2050, which, uh, if we <coughs> put it down, says some very, very important things about our everyday operation. In level one, the scope is the strategy wants to reduce the carbon intensity at the sea level. <coughs> so the CO2 per transport work should be reduced at the sea level. This is the first part. How are we going to do this? We are already doing this with the EDI in the design phase, with the energy efficiency design index. We are doing this. We have some thresholds, some limits. We cannot go beyond these limits in the design phase. In the operational phase, we will have same. We will have now the reporting. So, to say, to say it in sum, in level one, we are mostly okay. We are there. We are going to do it. <coughs> then, in level two, in, in the years to come, the carbon density of all of international shipping should be reduced. This is more, you know, more challenging because this, they say that the CO2 emissions per transport world should be at least 40% by 2030 or 70% by 2050 compared to what we emitted in 2008. So there's lots of work to be done there. This is the second level. You see what is the index? The index is the intensity, the carbon intensity. This means emissions <coughs> per transport work should be reduced. The third and most challenging level is to, oops, to reduce the greenhouse gas from the total in the national city, which has to uh, come until 2050. And this is that they said that we have to reduce the total annual uh, CO2 emissions by at least 50%, by at least. The upper limit is 100%. The low limit is 50%. Okay. So there is no more internal combustion engine. Exactly. <laughs> or, or decarbonization. But you are right. right. We want to have some comments about this later on. So let's define some of the targets. These are the first targets of this strategy, the short term, as we say. We have to do it to do them from uh, until the two, in five years, until the, uh, 2023. As I said. Energy efficiency, we are already doing it. But we have to, to do it with more uh, strict, maybe, uh, limits. The, what is interesting here is the second one, the second short-term measures. You see here, speed optimization and speed reduction as a measure. Which means what? Speed limit. This is the first time that an international <coughs> body discusses speed limit. Because, yeah? Stopno, you talk about speed and cargo, but what about the offshore sector? We don't deal with cargoes. Speed is not really a concern for us. Mm -hmm. You know. I know. So but you really, <coughs> what would you say about the offshore sector? No, this, this strategy is not for this. 
It's not for the regulation. It's for international shipping. About 5,000. But you have budgets, offshore concession budgets? Yes, maybe yes, maybe yes. But what if you if you see who are the emitters? The emitters are not in this uh, area. The emitters are those transferring cargo in long distances. Cargo ships are the main emitters. But what I want to point out here is that speed reduction, the limit. If we have selected the speed, uh, the slow steam in a, as a measure in recent years, we know that on the energy Use the slow steaming. We know that also other sectors have uh, selected this measure. Now we are going to do it systematically. We are going to decide, to decide. And this is what the short term uh, strategy of IMO says. So maybe in the uh, near future we're going to discuss the, the limit of speed in certain segments, in certain voyages, uh, in certain zip types. This is something new. Uh, okay, there are some uh, other measures that call for R&D. Okay, I, I'm very happy with this <laughs> because <laughs> there are going to be more funds in research. Uh, actually, the IMO is establishing an international ma maritime research board, uh, a board which is going to, you know, oversee all these uh, R&D initiatives. This is very important. We are going to see some different indices, indicators. Some of, it, of these are proposed, have been proposed in MEBC. Um, OK, I don't, know, I don't have too much to elaborate on this. But they are thinking about introducing some other indices, next to EDI or EOI. Uh, but what is most important is that for the first time, shipping is also discussing to address emissions of methane and uh, of VOX, volatile organic compounds. So this is also important. And there are also some uh, proposals for making first movers more, provide some help to them in order to implement uh, a very good and new technology that reduces emissions of greenhouse gases. So we're talking about money. They want to give money to ship owners, to early movers, to use them and improve their technology of process. This is happening in Europe. <coughs> there are European money going to ship owners who want to implement or to install <coughs> an energy efficiency technology of workshops. They are funded. This is going to happen now globally. <coughs> now, for the meter measures, I think that we have here already this measure, the market-based instrument, the well-known ETS, the Emissions Trading Scheme. This is something that Europe and the MRV is very fond of. They like it very much. It's actually, the rationale behind this is two companies or two ships, the one emits lower than the limit and the other one emits more than the limit. The one that has to, uh, the one that emits more than the limit buys. Buys. From the other one that emits lower to the limit. It pays money to emit more. <laughs> buys credits. That's yeah. Yeah. So we were we are going to develop a stock market of the CO2. <laughs> 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 how do you, you mean? How do you I don't know. really uh, be sure of your uh, statistics? What? How, are you sure? how can you be sure of a statistic? We can only find the statistic. Yeah. How do you mean about the price? The CO2? No, you're, you're talking about statistics of spending more. If I'm spending more, I can always find my statistics to be spending less. But if I pay money. I lose money because I need more. I maybe decide some at some point to implement <laughs> a technology to reduce less, to reduce the, the emission. This is a it's a simple logic. You emit, you pay money. You don't emit, you can earn money. This is the case. So that that is business, but how do you reduce the emissions by doing that? 
because you uh, trigger technology to be installed, you trigger ship owners or operators to buy technology because either way they will pay. <laughs> they pay without buying technology. They pay for the CO2, for the more CO2 that they make. They buy technology and they don't pay BTS. Uh, to inform you, ETS is now working for aviation. It is in place. Stephanos, yeah. I think to answer uh, uh, Captain Srikant's question, <coughs> he was asking how do you determine the credit levels? Did I understand right? Ah, so so I would, uh, even if you're consuming 1,000, I would say consuming 800. Okay, there will be a system where the... That's will, why you are reporting now. Yes. Reporting now. Yes. Yeah, I'm reporting. You yeah, no. reporting. What prevents me to buy bunkers and not declare it? You are going to report. You are going to report for three or four years. And the information will be collected in database of, uh, of the IMO, in our case, or for the Europeans in the MLB. So they, they believe, I'm not 100% sure, but they believe that they produce trustable figures. Uh, what is more interesting is that they, they are going to create this market of CO2, which exists in other sectors. It's not, but this is something that, uh, okay, from, the, from Greece where I'm, uh, Based, I know that ship owners are completely against this. Uh, you know, they don't like it. <laughs> yeah, they prefer, you know, in the market based uh, instrument discussion, which was first uh, begun in 2010 in IMO, ship owners propose to have to have a tax on the fuels that you buy, which is simple. It's a, this is a also a market-based instrument, huh? a tax on the fuel. I buy a fuel, the fuel, if burn emits CO2, I pay some money. Simple, but also market-based measure. This, this was the proposal of Sibon, but it was canceled. Anyway. Another meter measure is the uh, uptake of alternative low carbon or possibly zero carbon fuel. This is the end of the meter measures, which is going to end about 2013. And now, what it is, you have already said it, <coughs> the long term strategy is decarbonization. Decarbonization, which means many things. I can elaborate a few things about this. The goal is to not emit at all CO2. And if you ask me if, what other sectors are doing, they are heading in this. The road transport has specific plans to be decarbonized in 10 or 15 years. The road transport sector. Basically, we shift the emissions from, from road to somewhere else. <laughs> If it is electric, then the power station is everything will be zero. Yes. So it will be nuclear. Well, there, there are solutions for this. Okay. There, there are solutions yeah. for the production of uh, clean yeah. energy. Yeah. Yeah. With regard to the emission reduction, you said there's a lot of technologies coming in to reduce emission. How do they look to the science of combustion? Yes. They yes. are yeah. looking yeah. this. Of yeah. course, you know, there's a complete combustion <coughs> and there's under a few times. Mm -hmm. Which is there's uh, fuels under. Yes. And that was start emitting them. But this, this area, have they looked at it? Yes. But if you allow me one very, very technical comment the amount of CO2 emitted does not necessarily uh, refer to the way that they burn it, it refers only to the carbon content. Yeah. Because it's chemistry, it's a chemical reaction. How much? How much is the carbon content inside your fuel? Your fuel. This could to be emitted in the environment. Yeah, but it's a good idea to look to the chemistry of it as well. Yes. Yes. Well, maybe. Reduce. Maybe a, a fuel with a lower carbon content has a 
has a bigger intensity or bigger ownership value, let's say. They will create some fuel that are uh, here that are in discussion phase. But at the moment, we use carbon fossil fuels. There is a certain reaction. If you burn one ton of, of heavy fuel, you emit three tons of CO2. And that's it. But have you heard of combustion catalyst? Okay. It is not subject to the catalyst. The catalyst because this will accelerate. Yes, the maybe, 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 yes. But you will have also the. But I reduce emissions, reduce CO2, reduce yes, particles, metal particles, yes. salt, not everything. This is another, this is air pollution. <laughs> yeah. In the greenhouse gas, which is this thing <laughs> about, there's no much effect. You have to do something with the, with the carbon content of the fuel. Yeah, would that include reducing the SFOC as you indicate? Yes. Yes. So that's, uh, if you reduce the SFOC, you can burn the same fuel with the same engine. Same engine. With, with, with the same performance. Mm -hmm. the, the time the variable in. Uh, I accept it. Yes, yes. This, uh, this is a possible solution. But we are talking about big targets here. Uh, SFOC, all engine makers are trying to do it. Mm. They've got nothing to do with greenhouse green emissions. Everyone wants to bring the fuel consumption down, whether IMO or EU regulates it, everyone wants to do it. As a result of which you, burn, you emit less CO2? Right. <laughs> but that's already in place. Now new engines are... He, he spoke about something about combustion catalyst. Yeah. That is for socks and not. I don't think it has anything to do with carbon. So as he says, you've got a one ton of fuel, it's got so much carbon. There's nothing... You can it's do. a chemical reaction. It's not about the, the efficiency of the engine or the, the combustion chamber uh, capability. It's, uh, it is about uh, chemistry. It's simple. The one ton of fuel, just to elaborate a bit, the one ton of fuel, let's say, without doing anything, takes you 1,000 nautical miles. But if you use uh, some smart technology, uh, perhaps uh, what Dia said, it will take you 1,100 <coughs> nautical miles. So yes, no doubt, the yes. one ton is being burnt at the end of the day, yeah, 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 yeah. but it's not something along the way. Yes. Am yes. I understanding right here? That's why I, I, I totally agree. If you reduce <coughs> SFO, the amount. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you're saying, SFO. Mm -hmm. SFO. Okay. Yeah. Start yeah. A, any engine maker has already tried to do without this greenhouse gas. Would you not buy a Watsala engine if it says 140 yeah. grams yeah, per kilowatt hour compared with MAN which says 180? You buy the Watsala. Sure. But through the combustion itself, you reduce the consumption through that. Even, mm. for example, 100 gram. Yes. 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 You can get it to 170, 172 on that issue. Mm. So that's proof better. Mm. More. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that we have already uh, started the, the question and answers part. <laughs> you asked for it. <laughs> <laughs> no. I have one question. You are talking about everything above 5,000 cross channel. Mm. When do you think, oh, is there anything coming up for the vessel less than 5,000 in the coming future? Now, <coughs> we are talking about all, uh, people are talking about IMO regulation, all Marpol, subject to Marpol ships, or subject to Sholas ships. Which ships are subject to Sholas? 400. 400, 400 GDMO. Yeah, no. Ocean. <coughs> but you know, 5,000 5, Rostan and above, right? This is for 5,000 Rostan and above. No, no. The DCS, DCS now, currently, the DCS, this regulation is 5,000 and more for the reporting. But this long term strategy of IMO does not leak out <coughs> the domestic shipping or the coastal shipping or the ships of less than 5,000 GDMO. It is a strategy for all ships that are subject to IMO, <coughs> subject to international regulation, but also in national regulation. Mm -hmm. We have some evidence that domestic shipping produces too much of CO2 and also of air pollution, which is very important. Because as we said, air pollution affects us. The coastal city is near population, near people. So it's very important. If you ask me, I have no clear uh, answer yet, but I think yes, they're going to be in. Okay. Uh, any, any other questions?
question? And we, can we go to subject topic two? Yes. Okay. Let's go. Now we're talking about air pollution problems. We leave behind the greenhouse gases and the climate change. Our purpose here is not to give you the full spectrum of what is going on in the regulation and in the uh, our main purpose is to give you what is the market response in the 2020 global surface carbon. And uh, of course, we all know that there are three available options, either alternative fuels, either uh, biofuels LNG, and exhaust gas cleaning. Low sulfur fuels, we will discuss about them. But before going there, okay, this is not shown very well, I will try to explain it. This is a figure I collected only today, and it is the contribution of all the transport sector in the total emissions of air pollution emissions in the EU. And uh, here, the numbers for uh, shipping are not very, very satisfying. This is the contribution of SOX, surfer emission in, of shipping in Europe. It is 16% in the total emission of SOX in Europe. This is too much. It's too much. The same stands for the NOx, nitrogen oxides. And also for other, for other very, very important pollutants, PM, it stands for PM uh, 2.5, stands for particular matter, matter of diameter 2.5 micrometers. Uh, this is 7%. These are very, very harmful. This can be introduced in our body not only by breathing, by standing there. Yeah, from the skin. Yeah, from the skin. What is the acceptable limit of the PM? The, the limit? The limit of the PM emissions for the makers or for the society? You mean if there is some limit that we have a green on? Yeah. No. The reason that we are regulating SOX is also the PM. Because if you reduce SOX, you eliminate PM as well. They go together. This is why we have regulation about the SOX. The clean fuel does not have particular matter. Killing two birds. So with the SOX regulation, with the global server <coughs> up, we are trying also to eliminate the very, very harmful PM emissions, which are not that low. We have seen in the greenhouse gases that we are very low. Here we are not. We are high in the air pollution. Okay, and these are official uh, statistics for the European Environmental Agency. Compared with road transport, you see that road transport produces at the moment NOx, but not so much SOx. The SOx they don't use fuels with sulfur. They don't have. They don't have also particular matter. They don't trust me. We still have these kind of problems. So if you ask me if there, if there is a, a reason to implement this global self attack, there is. We are using the worst quality of fuels in transportation. And the problems are very, very important because we're talking about health problems. And our contribution is uh, <coughs> it's there. Now, what we have, we are going to have from 1st January 2020 a global surface limit, which is this one, 0.5%, global. We are also going to have this uh, another uh, sulfur limit which goes for certain areas called emission uh, control areas, ACAS. Some areas around the world 
uh, have their own regulation about the uh, control of software. Uh, for example, in European ports, there is a, another limit. In China, recently, there is another limit. In California, of course, we know that. And it's a very, very strict limit within the uh, 24 optimized uh, area. Now, what is important is that in this column, we are going to see uh, next slide some information about the scrubbers. Okay, scrubbers are accepted are a as a possible solution to uh, cover this limit. Also, NECA areas are accepted. But for Europe, for example, in, in some European ports, scrubbers which do, which do not uh, have some specific characteristics are not accepted. For example, it is the case of the open loop scrubbers, which produce a great amount of wastewater. Uh, they are not accepted to be the charts within the port limits. Uh, in China, for the time being, scrubbers are accepted. The most weird reaction is from California that <laughs> accepts the use of scrubbers, but you have to submit a study. You have to study. <laughs> you have to do a little bit of research, <laughs> research yeah? and uh, provide evidence that your installation, your system, is within the evidence. So it is not obvious that scrappers will be accepted all over the world. Yeah. Is there a reason why we had a ship going into Fajara just here, and there was a questionnaire regarding scrubbers, and it said that open loop scrubbers would not be permitted. Or would not but be. That's this area. Would not be. Or would not be. It wasn't in the boat. No. Yeah. no it, it, it was an open loop. No, that ship didn't have. I said the board sent a questionnaire to the ah, ship. Okay. Okay. Didn't and it told us quite clearly that an open loop scrubber would not would be not permitted be. in the world. Well, there's a huge discussion about this open loop scrubbers. Let's do it in the next slide that we are going to see some information about. So be aware, there is a global surface limit, but there are other limits as well. The global lab, uh, uh, limit is 0.5% of sulfur content in the fuel. Now, these are the available options to meet the global server limit, either by using low sulfur fuels, MDO, MGO, and even low sulfur heavy fuel, or alternative fuels, mostly LNG. And the different types of uh, scrubbers, wet types are two open loops or closed loop. Wet types are also hybrid. They are at the same time open and closed. They can be open loop uh, in open sea, and within the port limits can be closed to meet the requirements of, of ports. Uh, there are also some uh, new um, development with the, the so-called dry type of uh, scrubbers, but they are not so, you know, uh, commercialized yet. They're not in commercial states. But they are promising. Now, I have collected for you some questions <laughs> I'm trying to answer. The case of low sulfur fuels. One reasonable question is are they going to be widely available to meet the market needs? This is a question that I often hear. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can discuss this, yes. but the official, <laughs> but the official, uh, let's say, IMO uh, opinion, IMO has commissioned a study by Delft recently, and they say that uh, this field will be enough. Uh, it will be available in sufficient uh, volume by 2020. Uh, they also identify some other trends in other markets. They say that. The refined capacity will be enough uh, because other sectors will reduce the requirement of uh, low sulfur fuels. And there is, uh, this argument is not, uh, it's, it's a valid point. Uh, if we see the developments in the car industry, 
consider the diesel, let's say, demand, probably is going to go down. Now, another question about low shelter fuels is, of course, what will be the price of this fuel? Okay, now I bring my bicycle. Anyone knows? What will be? Anyone knows what will be the price? Two hundred dollars. Yeah, you think? Two hundred dollars. The low sulfur difference. Ah, the difference. Yeah, you are very right because the difference is what is important. The price difference. Because if I want to make a selection, I have to compare the two prices. At the moment, is in the order of. 253 in this order. That is from, that is from the scrubber maker. <laughs> yeah. But we don't know. Uh, well, the shipping industry, as we all know, has adopted a wait and see approach. They're not doing much. They're waiting to, for the uh, 2020 to come and see the, what will be the global reaction. This makes the switching to MGO or MDO the preferred option. If they don't do anything, they will use this fuel. Right? It's going to be very expensive as well. Right? Yes. So if we see what happened in the past, when we had the first uh, SECA areas, at that time, also shipping has adopted the same strategy of wait and see. So after the introduction of SECA, we, we saw uh, a grow in the, in the MGO especially <coughs> the next day <laughs> the next day the price of MGO went up probably it will be the same I, I don't know we don't know but uh, they say that the uh, same will happen and we will see the MGO price go up now another question Another discussion that we, are, that we are having also internally is what about the low flash point diesel? The low transport fuel. What about it? Is, is it an option? Well, currently it is not solar. Because of solar, of course. Because of the flash point. As I heard this morning, the flash point of road transport uh, diesel is in the order of 52, 52 53, 53, which is very close. Hmm? Who knows? Maybe we see a little bit of change in, in solar in the future. Maybe we don't go down 10, only 10. We are there. And this is not something that is far from uh, reality, because as we say, Diesel is going to be a fuel without a market if the road industry goes for the electric, electrification. There will be diesel that should be consumed. Right? So this is not in discussion. This is something that we are discussing at the moment internally. We are thinking why they are not discussing it. <laughs> But it is not far, the road transport fuel, it is not far from being inside the limits. So, at the moment, we cannot use it. It is out. Okay. Uh, what is the, the answer to all this question is that to meet the 2020 sulfur limit, the industry, the fuel industry, has to supply us, the shipping industry, with the fuels, with the MGO and the O. We are not to depend from other uh, solutions. And if we hear the official studies, they say that it will be enough. <laughs> the one study which says there will not be enough. <laughs> yes. you, know us, you know this study? I have a study that said yes, there will be enough. There was another study yeah, conducted, I don't enough. know by who, but it said there will not be enough. I scrub it and make it ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to scrubbers to see what is the situation there. We are not in favor of any solution. We are here to uh, discuss the solutions. 
and we're going to show you what is going on. If you see now from 2014 up to now, and with a little bit of projection, we can see that more or less 300 installation of scrubbers happen every year. We are in this state. In the national industry of 50,000 or 60,000 ships, we are installing 300 uh, scrubbers per year. Okay? Well, there are, we, we have collected some information from the makers. The projection, you see that it's very low. 5,000 installation, these are the makers' projection, until 2025, five years after the global subject. So even the makers, they see that their share of the market will not be enough, will not be much. They project a share in the market in the order of 10 and 20. 10 is a study I've read by another classification society, and 20 is the makers projection, of course. <laughs> so we are going to be in this percentage, between 10% and 20 of scrappers in the market of uh, 2020. Uh, this means that this solution, which is, I, uh, I can say that it is, okay, we can confront, we can comply with the software, but what about other regulations? As we saw in the first topic, there are other regulations. With scrubbers, you are tackling, you are uh, coping only with the sulfur. What about others? It's not I think that's why that the, the market share will stay low, even if it is uh, in the order of 20%. Now, which ships or which type of ships are more eager? or more close to install scrubbers, of course, are the passenger vessels, cruise or ferries. We have seen more installation in these uh, types of, uh, of vessels, and they say that uh, the payback time for passenger vessels is in the order of two or three years, the payback time. Uh, it's a solution, it's much more with their way of uh, trading. They are in a fixed lines, with fixed contracts. Passenger ferries in my country, in Greece, have fixed contracts for the next five years. They know that what they will expect, so they can go and start. Uh, but for tankers, we take into account the current fuel prices, the payback is five years or more. It is another payback time. This explains. I think uh, the approach of wait and see of uh, Okay, but the important here, the important point is that we are going to see more passenger ships installing uh, scrubbers. Actually, we know a very big owner with passenger ships. I don't name it. I don't name him. Who has actually built? Uh, he, has, he is a maker of scrubbers. <laughs> now, let's go now to the third option, into the alternative fuels. If we speak about alternative fuels, we are mostly speaking about the LNG, the methane. What we can share with you from a, a huge shipbuilding project that we are following, this is the ship of AIDA cruises. It's, it's going to be class in our class. And it's built, it is currently built in Papenburg, Megaverf. What we know from our work up to now is that LNGS fuel has nothing to do with <laughs> oil <Florida> fuel. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> They're two different ships. We are thinking of even introducing new regulations, new rules about this. This ship has uh, uh, LNG bunker tanks of, uh, I think, 3,500. Only the, the tanks are for the bunker. LNG. And there are huge challenges 
technical in the design phase, but there will be also some more challenges in the operation because, because it's another fuel. We have to train people on board. Uh, you know that with the temperature of this uh, on board the ship, do you know what it is? Minus one six. So blanket, storage, distribution, use, maintenance will be issues for our industry. It is not an easy uh, <coughs> option. But there are some other uh, projects that we are uh, following. This is the first passenger vessel in the Mediterranean Sea that's going to be uh, powered by LNG. A small passenger or passenger ferry, <coughs> approximately 1,000 passengers. And this is another project. These are our uh, agreed projects. They are going to be built with LNG in Valeria. Cantier Navale, the same team. Now, and the, this, uh, this is the, what we call the huge project. It's, it's four ships, two of these vessels are going to uh, be for Costa Colchere, 1,080,000 uh, GP, two sister ships, and two ships for Aida. These are the, this is a, a very, very challenging uh, project for LNG, but it is currently uh, on the road. Uh, these are going to be the first ships in the cruise industry to be powered by LNG. LNG has potential but has also some uh, problems. What I would like to discuss now is, is, is it the fuel of the future? What do you think? The LNG. And for triggering the discussion, I have a question for you. As we saw it, you burn one ton of fuel oil and you produce more or less three tons of CO2. If you burn one ton of LNG, how much of CO2 do you produce? Do you know? 2.5. Greenhouse gas, eh? CO2. How much of CO2 do you produce? Zero. Zero. Three. Zero? Zero. 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 Is in air pollution, not in the greenhouse gas fight. In climate change, it is about the same. We know that LNG is going to be, we call it a transition fuel for the maritime transport. We are going to see it in the market in the next, I don't know, 10 or 15. 20 years. But in air pollution, we see clear benefits. No shocks at all. LNG does not contain sulfur. PM, nearly 90%. As we say, if you take out sulfur, you take out also PMs. So, very good in air pollution. In NOx, 80%, more or less. <coughs> clear benefits in air pollution. But in greenhouse gases, not so clear. Now, let's conclude. I see faces, I see faces <laughs> eager to go on. Let's discuss about future plans, real future plans. We have now this yeah. engines. The so time to change says that you have to put them out. This is going on in the transport industry. 
and a decision by governments, by the government of France, by the government of the Netherlands, to take out all the engines, the thermal engines, from cars with a specific timeline. The timeline is not that long, huh? it's uh, 10, 15, or 20 years. They have decided. And the future is more or less okay. electric. Mm. This is the future. Also for us. Also for us. And if we, uh, how, how long it would take, it takes place right now. It is happening. Also for shipping. I collected some information from the news. You see here, fully electric cargo ship launched in uh, China. This is information 2017, last year. Yeah. New all electric, I'm sure you heard about this, autonomous cargo ship is planned for operation this year. It is working now. This month. It's not in our class. Stefan, I have a question. Yeah. You have a fully electric ship, how are you recharging the batteries? What? How are, are they recharging the batteries? Okay. These are, these are problems that the industry is facing. But there are solutions. There are solutions. With the diesel engine? There are solutions. One solution I can tell you. Well, this solution at the moment it goes only for much of these years. Have you heard about them? Yes. I have some uh, slides. Yes. The first hydrogen power cruise ship is scheduled and it's going to be uh, in the CPR next year. Has been designed. The contract has been signed last year. Now, what is a fuel cell? Fuel cell is a very, very promising technology. Why? Because it's a very simple technology. This is like a, a filter or something. Uh, and you enter. This is the limit. Uh, <laughs> now, on the one side, in the anode, you, the input is hydrogen. On the other side, it is oxygen. The reaction inside produces electricity. The most important thing is what is the output? What is the emission? Water. The emission is water. water. And heat. That is the emission of fuel cell. So you may be asking me why? Why don't we <laughs> implement it right now? Because producing hydrogen is very, very expensive at the moment. And hydrogen is a very, very difficult uh, yeah, to store and to cover. We have to solve the issues before this in order to implement widely the solution of fuel cells. But they are very promising. Rina is doing research. I am involved in research in this area, in fuel cells. We are designing solutions for small ferries that have not so much uh, demand of power on board and we are designing portable let's say power uh, solution that can be charged at the source sure, exactly. it can be fitted easily on board the vessel it can go How long? for half an hour do you know how many how many of these lines uh, lines we have in Greece within ports? Too many. There is a line. I don't know. Have you been in Greece? Yes. In Piraeus, there is a line Piraeus Salamina. Mm. The emissions of greenhouse gases in this line is huge. <laughs> huge. But Salamina, you can see from there. You you can swim to Salamina. <laughs> <laughs> But the mission of these little ships is huge. This is a solution for them. Uh, I'm sure there are, there are many areas, areas around the world with the same problem. In this coastal area, 
cholesterol. Not this particular, not the fuel cell. It is quiet, it's silent, no vibration, no noise, no maintenance. You just change the frequency. Not at all. And you can also utilize the heat. The problem is this, how you create in a cost-effective and safe way the hydrogen. One very, very promising source of hydrogen is methane. Because in methane, in LNG, we have four atoms of uh, hydrogen. It's a very, very good source. If I can drop out the, the carbon, I have four atoms of hydrogen. I can use LNG to put it in here. Eh? Do you know that there are ship owners in Greece that are discussing of installing on board a small fuel cell to produce some electricity from the boil off gas that they have? Because they lose it. They lose it. They don't do anything about it. And they are asking, we are in discussion with a, with a shipping company that asked us to provide a feasibility study of how much will cost and what will be the benefit. Because this boiled off gas on board an LNG carrier, it happens. We know it. So maybe it is a, a promising solution. The problem here is that we cannot produce, at the moment, uh, a great amount of, fire, of power. We can produce something between 5 and 50 kilowatts. But multiplied per hour might be 500 kilowatts per hour, which is for some uh, engines, it's enough. And some, um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, is it loud enough? Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> the byproduct, when we use methane to convert methane into hydrogen, yeah. I understand the byproduct of methanol. Am I correct? Methanol, methanol is not a byproduct. No. What, what byproduct do we get, or what product do we get when we extract hydrogen from methane? Ah, so you are talking about the reaction before, before this. Yes. Before this, we call it a reforming reaction, a reformer. We, we use a device that is called the reformer. The reformer takes the, the fuel, the methane, drops the carbon. Where? You drop the hydrogen out. <laughs> and you, yeah. you introduce the hydrogen inside the fuel cell. So the problem is how much it costs to produce the hydrogen and where the carbon goes. <coughs> and because I remember reading about it about two years or three years ago, that US was facing a huge problem at the hydrogen cell plants of getting rid of that reformant. Yes. And that is causing a lot of landfill and you know environmental yes. disasters there. So they have cut down on the yes. CO2 this hydrogen. Now, for your information, there is a huge area of research in fuel cells, but before, in the reforming process. There is huge, and there are huge opportunities. We have some companies that are producing very, very effective reformers. We have other companies that can capture the carbon <coughs> from the reforming process. It's an area with huge research activity uh, these years. And they are considered very, very promising. Fuel cells can go together with batteries in a hybrid installation of work <coughs> to answer the question that you are uh, no, because you uh, talked about boil off yes. and boil off is already used on uh, most of the LNG and LNG carriers yes. it, by using I use it as a, as, as a and and the turbine so in, in the turbine it, sorry in a turbine it gives better results yes so you don't have to convert it into anything else yes. what, what we know from uh, well from this particular shipping company they say that they, we have more we have uh, more oil off than we need. Even if, even if we are making the best to utilize it. We know that they want to look at us. And currently, we are about to uh, begin this feasibility study. What we know is that this is not a solution that we are going to see in a year or, in, or even in five years. But this is a very, very promising solution because, because it has the clear benefits to the environment. It will have to find ways to uh, solve the problem of, of carbon in the fuel that we are reforming, then this solution might be 
are very good. And there are also projects. You see these two new ships powered by LNG and fuel cells combined. And also Viking cruises and wheels that are, they have plans for uh, cruise ship with uh, fuel cells. So this means that the market is it's preparing, it's looking at this opportunities. We also know that also the power plants are doing the, uh, they have a huge appeal in the fuel cell area. But let's go beyond even fuel cells to finalize it. The world's most valuable resource is going to be data, information in the future. If you have the information and you know how to use the information, you probably uh, end up in making good energy efficiency. This is very, very important. Uh, we're going to see also the digital chip. What is the digital chip, you may ask me. We think that it is many things. It is, we have now uh, unmanned ships. We have three ships utilizing what we call the big data, the smart ships. <coughs> we have what we call the digital twin. This is an area that is under uh, discussion and research at the moment. You will have on your laptop all the ship in a digital form, live, on your computer. Uh, so, of course, monitoring, inspection, maintenance tools are being developed with the help of, uh, of the digital, of the IT and the OT solutions. And what we are doing, we are trying to follow this development. Arena is currently preparing this platform that we call the Q, just to follow the digital era and to be ready for this. And you see all kinds of services or works that we provide in the shipping industry are going to be inside this digital platform. This is the way to go forward. In 20 years from now, all of our ships will be digitalized. That's for sure. And one criticism about our industry is that it is quite low in introducing IT, information technology. Okay. I see that we are tired. I finished. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. The purpose was not to answer to all the questions, but to give you an insight of what is going on in these two main areas of concern about uh, air emissions of shipping, in the greenhouse gases area and in the air pollution area. I know that we'll have to solve tomorrow's problems. I know that we are all focused in this, to solve tomorrow's problems in the office. But it is good to have also an insight of what is going on around the world and what is expected in the near future. For this, I thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the IMRS uh, remains resolute in fulfilling our uh, global ironclad commitment to the spreading of knowledge and the dissemination of appropriate information to the broad spectrum of marine professionals, both at the local and in the international levels. And for this, we, for this to fructify, we rely on the strong partnerships that we have forged with companies who are at the forefront of maritime technology and innovation. And a primary example is RENA, which has, uh, which has really addressed the contemporary topic of ship air emissions, and which according to me and was quite evident, has delivered a tremendous value to all of us in the room today, comprising of uh, varied stakeholders from the regional maritime industry. So ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in saying uh, grazie mille to Turina and uh, show our appreciation. Thank you.
you very much, uh, Andrea. Thank you very much, uh, Cosas, for 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 uh, sponsoring today's meeting. Uh, you must know that this whole meeting and having 138 people wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for Miss Maria. <laughs> <laughs> We spent quite a lot of time together, you know, putting this together. So thank you very much. Uh, as a token of our appreciation, I will request uh, the senior most uh, IMRS member uh, of the Middle East, uh, Mr. Mehta, to open that magic box. Uh, I will I will do the dirty work, you do the clean work. Uh, and if we can have Stefanos accept this on, on our behalf. Thank you very much.